So, um, what I tried to show in the last video uh, was that any time you perform some kind of inductive argument, you make an inductive inference, you are implicitly assuming the uniformity of nature thesis, which says the same laws of nature operate in all places at all times. Now, that might actually go a little too far. The way Hume puts it is you're assuming that the future will be like the past. But it's not just that. Um, it's got to go beyond that because we don't only perform induction when it comes to predicting the future. Mill some, or Hume sometimes talks about it that way. But we're doing induction anytime we come to a conclusion about things that haven't been observed. So, for example, whenever a scientist tells you anything about dinosaurs, whenever a scientist tells you anything about evolution, when any time a scientist tells you anything about the formation of the Earth and the solar system, they're actually performing induction. You might think, oh, they're not. We know dinosaurs exist. We've got fossils. How could they not exist? Well, think about the kind of inference that is going on when you take a look at a stone, what's effectively a stone in the shape of a bone, um, or at least what feels like a stone in the shape of a bone. Uh, and you come to the conclusion that once upon a time, there was a creature that walked around with this bone. Right? What you're doing is the following. You're saying, well, how do bones get places, right? Like, what can explain why I found this bone here? And what you know from making observations about the world you actually inhabit is bones get there when animals die, right? Uh, in particular, bones don't just pop up on their own. If a bone got there, then that bone used to be part of an animal that had a functioning skeleton. And then that animal died, and the bones stayed, stuck around and the um, animal didn't, or the rest of the animal didn't, rather, right? Um, what you know is that every time you've ever found bones, that's been the story behind them. And that there's never been just, like, bones that pop up like plants do. It's weird to have to, like, put it this way. Because you might think, well, that's just obvious. It's just obvious that if bones are in the ground, the bones got there because there used to be an animal. But it's not quite obvious, an inference is being made, a really good inference, an inference, where you're basing your claim about how something happened that you didn't observe, because you didn't see the bones get in the ground. You're basing that inference on um, processes that you've observed uh, in the actual world, right? Like you've, uh, in the world that you live in, you've seen the way nature works, and you assume nature used to work the same way. Um, when people tell you about Pangaea, right, all the continents used to be all mushed together to one big landmass, and then over time they split apart. What's happening is we're looking at the continental drift that we can actually detect. Like every year, apparently, the continental plates move about an inch. Right? Somebody measured it. Um, you can detect that nowadays. And if you make the assumption that the same process of slow movement, right, convection, right, like one, one plate going under another, one plate like being pushed up out, all the processes that lead to continental drift, it's, if it's not clear already, I, I've forgotten what those processes are, but I do know that they're slow. Um, if you take that process and you say that process has been going on constantly and you look backwards in time, and you're like, well, what, how much would have it moved? if this process has been going on for like 200 million years and you extrapolate it out and you do all the calculations, the really hard work of science, you get to the conclusion that, oh, Africa and South America used to be right snug up against each other. And that's why it looks like, you know, they're puzzle pieces that would fit together. So when you do inductions about the past, you're also effectively assuming that the same processes that determine how things behave in the world you observe have been at play right? in the past. They've been at, they'll be at play in the future. They've been at play in the past. They are at play right now in parts of the universe you can't observe. Right. Um, so like, how do we know what's going on in the center of the sun? Well, we know something about how atoms work, right? We know something about the nuclear process. How do we know that? Well, we know that from making observations here on Earth. We don't know it from ever making observations on the inside of the sun. And we're assuming that the stuff that we observe on Earth, um, and more importantly, we're assuming the laws that govern the stuff that we observe on Earth are also operative in the center of the sun. Right? So anytime you do induction, 
you're assuming that there's some kind of uniformity to nature. You're assuming there's uniformity in the laws so that when you discover the laws that describe accurately or predict accurately the things you actually observe, you can project those laws into the unobserved cases, past, present, future. And then the question becomes, what reason do we have to believe that the same laws operated in the past will operate in the future and are now operating across the universe? It seems like you have to assume that for any induction to work. So how do you know that? Well, remember that Mill thought your only way to get information is through your senses, through impressions. You can also get them through your passions. I mean, your passions are kind of impression. In other words, they're sensations and passions. But if you're talking about knowledge about how the external world works, it's really just your sensations that matter. So you have as your fundamental evidence base, you have sensations. That's uh, what you see, hear, taste, touch, smell. Um, now, you might have some other senses. I mean, there's especially a lot of people who think you have a kind of internal sense so that um, you always know, like, where the parts of your body are. Kinesthesia, I think it's called. Um, like, you don't have to listen or look to figure out that your arms are moving. You can just feel them moving. But put that to one side because, again, that's not giving you knowledge about the outside world. Um, so you've got your sensations. That's where all your evidence fundamentally comes from. So here's the question. How can we get from the things that we have sensations of? How can we get from our sensations to the uniformity of nature thesis? Um, well, what happens, remember, Hume thinks, is that your sensations, because they're impressions, they get copied into memories. And those memories can be broken apart. Right? Your mind can analyze, synthesize. Right? Um, your mind can associate the uh, sensations you had and the memory of the sensations you had with uh, things that are um, uh, contiguous with them, uh, with uh, things that uh, uh, your sensations are said to cause or the things your sensations of are said to cause. So I've got a sensation of a uh, Mountain Dew can here because it's 4 a.m. in the morning and I'm still here recording. Um, I, when I have this sensation, I form a memory of the can in my head and I can... Um, move from that memory to the memory of the uh, Mountain Dew spilling all over everything because turning the can caused that to happen. I'm not going to show you that because I, I drank it. It's empty. I uh, can't show it to you now. But you can do all that. But more importantly, Hume thinks, you can reason about it. Right? And reasoning comes, he says, apparently in two forms. There's deduction. And there's induction. He's here just following Aristotle. And again, following Aristotle, Hume seems to think the following is true. Deduction right, is um, making an inference from some general truth to some more particular truth. Or if not more particular, then no more general, right? So you don't go from um, a particular truth to a general truth with deduction. So for example, um, let's say I um, have uh, had a lot of uh, Mountain Dew Baja Blast. And every time I've had Mountain Dew Baja Blast, it's been terrible. It's just tasted awful. I can't use deduction to go from, well, I tried three cups of Mountain Dew Baja Blast and they've all been awful. I can't use deduction to go from that evidence base to all Mountain Dew Baja Blast tastes terrible. That's not what deduction does. That would involve drawing a conclusion that goes beyond the information I have in the premises. The premises here are, well, this one time I tried Baja Blast and it sucked and the second time I tried Baja Blast and it sucked. And, you know, that's my evidence. Deduction never gives you a conclusion that goes beyond the evidence. That's how deduction gets certainty. Right? Deduction allows you to um, draw a conclusion that is absolutely certain given the truth of the premises because it never goes beyond the information contained in the premises. So deduction 
never goes from particular to general. That's what induction does. Induction goes from particular to general. Remember, that's what um, Aristotle introduced uh, induction to do. He says you start with observations and you move from the observations to the general truths. Right? So induction goes from particular to general. Well, what are our sensations? Well, our sensations are particular. Every sensation you have is of a particular event. Like, you don't have a sensation of all the swans at once. You have a sensation of a particular swan. You don't have a sensation of the taste of every last sample of Baja Blast. You have a single, uh, uh, a sensation of a single case of Baja Blast, right? Or a single can or bottle. So sensations are particular. Right? Sensations give you particular bits of knowledge or particular bits of information. Okay. Well, what's the uniformity of nature thesis? Well, it's incredibly general. It tells you something about everything in the universe. It, it, what it tells you about everything in the universe is everything in the universe obeys the same set of fundamental laws. So, if that's the case, if we're supposed to be moving from particular right, evidence given to us by our sensations, sensations, to the uniformity of nature thesis, which is a general truth, then we can't use deduction. That's not what deduction does. The only way we could use deduction to justify the uniformity of nature thesis is if we derive the uniformity of nature thesis from some more general claim um, or from some other general claim. We would have to already know something about the entire universe in order to deduce that everything in the universe operates by the same laws if we were using deduction. But suppose that were true, and I'll give you an example of how that could be done. Suppose you knew about the universe that God created it. And suppose you knew about God, that God is all good. And suppose you know about all good beings, that they have an orderliness to them. Well, then you could maybe make the argument that God would not have made a chaotic universe. God would have made a universe that operated by clear rules and always operated by those rules. Then, if that was the case, you could say, well, given that God made the universe and given that God has these features, then the uniformity of nature thesis must be true. I'm like, all right, there we go. You can use deduction to do that because you'd be going from a general claim about the universe that it was all made by God this all good orderly being, to another general truth, right? Maybe even a, a, a less general truth, right? Something that doesn't contain as much information as the original claim. The original claim is God made the universe, which is going to allow you to deduce not only that, the uh, that nature is uniform, it's also going to allow you to deduce all sorts of other things, right? That like everything works out for the best, maybe. Who knows? That'd be nice. But that would just push the problem back one way. Uh, back another step, rather, for Hume. Hume would say, okay, suppose we did deduce the uniformity of nature thesis from some claim about God creating the universe. Well, how do we know that God created the universe? Right. Where did we get the general truth? And the problem is going to be that if all of our evidence starts out as particular bits of information, which is, again, what Aristotle thought, and it seems like we only have one way to learn any general truth, whether that general truth is the uniformity of nature thesis or something that you derived the universe, the uniformity of nature thesis from. That that way of, go, of learning general truth has to be induction. That's what induction does. That's why Aristotle introduced induction. It was a way of getting around Plato. Plato thought the only way that knowledge makes sense is if we derive um, anything we know from general truths, right? De those general truths being the definitions of key concepts. And then Plato said, and the only way that makes sense is if we've always known those general truths, if we were born knowing those general truths. And Aristotle was like, mm-mm, mm-mm, don't like it, right? I don't care for this view. I don't think we're born knowing, like, what a cow is. And so, like, we have to figure out some other way of gaining general knowledge about a cow. And so what Aristotle does is he says, we gain knowledge about cows and everything else in the world by observation. Observation gives us particular bits of knowledge. And we get to general knowledge. We get to knowledge of general truths 
by induction. And so here's what Hume is pointing out. In order for induction to work, we would already have to know that one of those general truths is true. We would already have to know that the uniformity of nature thesis is true because it's assumed every time you perform induction, every time you go from the results that you've discovered about the observed cases to making claims about the unobserved cases, you're assuming that things work the same way for the unobserved cases as they did for the observed cases, which means you're assuming the uniformity of nature, but you have no basis for doing so because the uniformity of nature thesis is not something your sensations tell you, which means you would have to reason from that information provided to you by your sensations. But there's only two forms of reasoning. One is deduction, and that's out because you don't know any general truths because all you have are sensations. And the other one is induction. But of course, you can't use induction to prove the uniformity of nature thesis because in order to do induction, you have to assume the uniformity of nature thesis. That would be to argue in a circle, right? You would say, well, I will prove the uniformity of nature by showing that every time we've made the observations, the laws have been the same. Hume would just say, that's fine. But what about the cases you haven't observed? How do you know the uniformity of nature thesis works there too, right? What you're doing is an induction and then that means you have to assume the uniformity of nature thesis, which is the exact thing you're trying to prove. So what Hume aims to show is that every time you do induction, you're assuming a general truth. You can't prove that general truth by deduction because you don't have anything to derive it from because the fundamental source of all our evidence is our sensations. And you can't prove it by induction because that would be circular reasoning. So you can't prove it at all. So there's no reason to trust induction, which means we don't actually have two forms of reasoning that are legitimate. We only have one form of reasoning that's legitimate, and that's deduction. So you might think, well, all right, let's get rid of that X now. Except, remember, deduction involves reasoning from general truths to particular truths. But all of your evidence comes ultimately from your sensations, which are particular truths. So what general truths are you supposed to know that you can perform deduction on? Where are the premises for your deductive argument coming from? If you can't do induction, and if all the evidence you have comes from your sensations, which only give you particular bits of knowledge, it seems like the only thing you can ever know then right, is what you're observing because induction is illegitimate and deduction needs some general truth to work, but you won't know any general truths because you needed induction to get them, you, get, to get you those general truths. So if the problem of induction is right, then the only form of legitimate reasoning, deduction, is a kind of reasoning you can't use because you don't have any general truths to derive anything interesting from. So the problem of induction is a very significant skeptical argument because it seems like where it leaves you is that the only thing you know is what you observe. And if you think about it, it's not like you know everything you've observed. Because think about the way memory works. Like, why do you trust your memory? Like, let's say you remember something. Like right now I'm thinking back in time and I remember the time my family took me to Paris when I was a kid. We already lived in Europe. My parents were in the military and we were stationed in Germany. And so we got to take these fun little trips and we took a train trip to Paris. And I remember getting raspberries at this little shop in Paris. And we went and we sat down on um, some nice marble thing. I don't even know, remember what it was now, but it was marble. It was a bench and it was marble. And I was eight years old and I was looking at it like, this is fancy. And I put the raspberries down, not realizing that wet raspberries, some of which had been crushed because people were reaching in them and like shoving them in their mouths and raspberries are delicate and they burst, right? Not realizing that when I picked up the raspberries again, I had made a red stain on the marble. 
And then I remember my parents getting really worked up and being like, we got to get out of here. We got to get out of here now before anyone sees that we've stained this like important whatever marble bench. I remember that. And so I think it happened because I remembered it. But why should I think it happened? Right? I've got this thing in my head. I've got this image in my head, a se series of images in my head. Not just images too. I feel like I can remember what it, what the raspberries tasted like. I feel like I can remember that the, the marble was cold when I sat on it and touched it. I feel like I can remember all sorts of things. But those are just sensations that I've copied. What reason do I have to think those sensations were actually caused, like were actually caused by that event really happening? How do I know this memory isn't bogus? Because I've had bogus memories before. You probably had this experience too. Now here's what you might think. Well, I know how memory works. There are some bogus memories, it's true, but by and large, the things you remember, something very similar to that happened. You might be like, okay, great. How do you know that? How do you know that by and large your memory is accurate? Right? You're like, well, every time I've checked a memory, it's been accurate. Well, then it seems like you're making an inductive argument there. Right? Or most, so you've got as evidence, most of the time I've directly checked a memory it is uh, turned out that the memory was accurate. Maybe not all the time, but most of the time. So the memories I haven't checked are uh, very likely to be accurate. But then you're going from the cases where you've done the proper observations, you've uh, had the memory and you've checked the memory to the cases where you haven't checked the memory. And you're assuming that what was true of the earlier case is true of the later cases. But that's induction and induction's out. So there's no reason to trust your memory. So not only are you only left knowing the things you um, have had sensations of, you're only really left knowing the things you're having sensations of right now because you can't trust your memory because the argument you would need to trust your memory, that would require induction and induction is out. So this is the skeptical problem of chapter four. Chapter five is going to give a skeptical solution to the skeptical problem. And that will be for another video.